Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar uh, this morning. Um, uh, Dan's going to be talking about the uh, volume browser, uh, all the neat setup and XML files and so forth in AWIPS 2. And uh, as you may or may not know, uh, I think Dan's been doing volume browser work on AWIPS since before there was an AWIPS. Just kidding. But anyway, uh, Dan, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so I appreciate the people that are on the call today. Um, I guess the idea here behind this training is is to try and, and spread some knowledge uh, through uh, the weather service. This this recording may may uh, may travel, and um, y you know we're I'm kind of at a in an interesting point here because I really don't have the software to effectively be on the A2 and uh, transmit a, a webinar medium type of briefing to you so um, to, to, to train effectively and to show some of the dynamic aspects of you know changing files and what the results are and some of those things. So from a technological standpoint, this talk is PowerPoint, and then I will be jumping out to some of the, the A2 files that are out there. Uh, so from a technology standpoint, it's not the most ideal, uh, but, but I think it'll, it will work uh, to get people started. And um, I guess the, the, the intent of this, this training is, is introduction, introductory material, kind of a conversation starter, if you will. Um, I don't know if we'll do you know, maybe future ones that are maybe a little bit more advanced and build on this first one. The idea was to try and introduce uh, those sites with A2 or those sites that are getting A2, which is everyone, um, some infrastructure starting point and knowledge uh, of how to edit the volume browser and some of the fields and to look at the science behind some of the fields as well. There's a, there's a good many questions that come to me um, over the years. I've been kind of the guy that people email about the volume browser and um, and I get a lot of questions, and I think if we get some of this knowledge out there, people will be able to explore themselves and, and, and change some of the infrastructure themselves. Um, so um, there's a, maybe some of you on the call that, that know the volume browser in A2 better than I do. I, I am not the expert in A, A2 volume browser. Um, I've done a good number of changes mainly to, uh, to rescue my system from the baseline. Uh, the baseline came in and added a good deal of functionality, but there's some some real drawbacks in there as well. So I unfortunately took thought I would leave the volume browser project on the A1, uh, on the doorstep of A2, and um, unfortunately it's not working out that way. So I'm much more involved in A2 volume browser simply because someone has to do this work, I feel like, and uh, we can get some of the fixes in place before the baseline um, changes would occur too far downstream to me uh, to wait. So a couple thank yous. First, Matt Foster, if you haven't figured it out yet, he's an A2 superstar that we have in our region. Um, he is um, always the guy that gives me an answer. Um, it's very rare that he doesn't have an answer, and, and I, I, I feel good on that day where he can't answer me because I've even stumped Matt Foster. So he's a superstar. Um, so thanks, Matt, for all your help you've been uh, over the last year. And then, John, thanks for helping me get this this uh, some of the ideas you guys had yesterday to get this into a format that we could present it in. Okay, so let's kind of move forward here um, uh, with the talk. Uh, some of the goals, again, just to, to provide an introduction. So, so some of you that are more knowledgeable in the volume browser and have done some work in A2, you may find this kind of uh, boring, uh, not, not the most challenging, but I have to start somewhere uh, with the foundation and some of the files that you need to touch and get into. So um, obviously the, the idea here is to spread knowledge um, and empower people to correct their own problems um, and also develop new science that they're doing locally or uh, that are coming out in the papers um, with the idea on better mission services. Obviously that's my whole intent when we started this in A1 in 2002. Uh, was to, to flood the AWIP system with fields so we could actually look at science um, from a forecast standpoint rather than a uh, what was then um, FSL 
development lab standpoint. So um, that's, that's where we're going. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, I guess I have to do this work in volume, or this volume browser work in A2. Uh, again, maybe I could put it on there. Uh, so here's what we're going to be going through. And, and please, if you have <coughs> additional information, uh, Dale, I don't know if you're on this from WDTB, but um, any information that you may have on additional training resources that are out there or um, um, any other comments, uh, please let me know. Uh, please interrupt. And also, if anyone on the call on this training has questions, please just ask the question uh, because we'll probably all learn uh, from, from going through it. Um, so Dan, we're going to look Dan, at... Uh, uh, this go is, ahead. This is Dale. I, I, I am here. So. Okay, great. Um, so just, just kind of moving through this here, we're going to start, uh, we're going to use the localization perspective on A2. Um, it it's provides an, a nice file editing infrastructure that we didn't have before. You had to get into the, the real basics of the, the, the file and, and VI them or text edit them. And so now the localization perspective gives us some organizational editing um, um, to, to do a better job there. Um, of, of managing and editing and, and some of those things makes it much easier to, to do that editing. Um, we'll get into menus um, and, and how you look at fields and planes and how those are uh, um, put into the infrastructure, how you can change a menu. Um, we'll also look at um, some of the fields that are in the system and derive parameters and how to track some of those down and some of the units and um, how to change a uh, derived parameter or a, a parameter field in A2. We'll look at some color tables, how you change units, how you set default color tables, um, and then a little bit of bundles and families depending on how long this training takes. Kind of hard to judge, um, and I don't want to go too long with it. I know we were scheduled for an hour and a half. Um, we'll just kind of see how that, how that falls out. I'm certainly not going longer than an hour and a half because I don't think this is the most exciting in the world, presentation in the world. Um, and my own worst critic. Okay. There is some static and uh, some line noise. If you can just check to make sure you're on mute, um, that would quiet it down a little bit. So let's start first in the localization perspective. Um, what I'm showing here is just the A2 localization perspective. Um, that if you don't have A2, it's um, it's one of the nice editing uh, areas that you'll have uh, to work in. And there's two main areas that the volume browser infrastructure falls under. It's uh, the cave uh, subfolder. Uh, there's a number of items in there, including um, the bundles directory that uh, has to do with some of the families that are in the system. Um, there's also the uh, style rules area. Um, that is where all the rules um, style rules are what define your contours and your um, units and your default images, color, color curves that you load, um, some of those different things if you're not familiar with the volume browser. Um, and then the color maps area holds all your, uh, all your coloring for um, and, and um, images and, and color enhancements. Under D2D, the big ones are uh, the volume browser down here um, that we'll look at and uh, also derive parameters. That's where a lot of the field, field code uh, to calculate those parameters are, are located. So I'm going to just start off by, um, by working through some of the basic menuing systems here. So I'm in the cave submenu under menus. And uh, within this uh, infrastructure, you'll see a bunch of different things. Um, it's not just volume browser, but it's the entire cave um, menuing structure here. We have upper air in there, then the volume menu, um, and then this XML directory down at the bottom, which is fairly benign in its name, um, but it holds a good portion of the volume browser field and plain menu. So that menus XML folder is, is a key one. We're going to look at that a little bit, a little bit more. So when you're working in the localization perspective, again, just a reminder um, that w the first thing you'll want to do is copy whatever level file there is into a user level file. So you'll have to have rights if you don't have rights to this. You'll have to get rights to edit in the localization perspective. 
All right, so we're moving through, moving toward looking at some of the menus that are within the volume browser in the A2 infrastructure. We've gone down into the cave menu under the localization. We're under menus, and then we've scrolled down under the menus into this XML folder, and we've opened that up, and you see a bunch of different files in there: uh, field menus .xml. Uh, and then plain menus, plan view, .xml, those, con those contain the menuing structure of the fields that you have in your v volume browser GUI and the, uh, and the planes or levels. Um, they're called planes officially in the, the volume browser. And again, just to mention that if you do some of this work, the, the hierarchy in editing in the localization perspective is to copy the base. You'll probably just have a base file here. Um, you may have a site file if you worked on it already, but copy that into a user file and do your work under the user perspective uh, to check it out uh, to make sure that it's all good, and then you would promote it to the site level uh, for all your uh, for all your workstations and system to see. So when you're under the user, it's only your user that is affected by it. So it's a fairly safe environment to work in. That um, many of you know this. I just wanted to kind of touch on it. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a picture of the volume browser on, off my system, and, and so we can look at the file uh, details themselves a little bit, and you'll have a little bit of perspective on where we are. So let's look at this fields area. I've got uh, uh, height and pressure, temperature, moisture across the top, and we're just doing that as a as kind of a placeholder. So when we go in the file, you can see where we're located. And then planes, I have pressure. Uh, temperature, uh, theta across the top. And then I've just broken out my miscellaneous uh, volume browser. Here's the drop-down menu uh, that comes out of that. And I, I wanted to just illustrate what it looks like to have sub-menus uh, in that XML file that we'll look at um, uh, in just one second. So kind of keep that in mind of, of how that, that looks, at least visually, as we move toward uh, the, X, the raw XML code. Okay, so I've gone into now this field menus file. Again, um, let me just move this over here. So, okay, so your screen should be looking at the raw XML file. Uh, and what you should see there is the first contribute item there is height pressure under that name. Um, and you just have to kind of become familiar with these little. Um, uh, statements in here and some of the important uh, variables to look at. And it's pretty straightforward. I think key um, is one that you'll, you'll want to uh, key on. <laughs> uh, and, and this key here in these files is really the, is the derived parameter or what the actual uh, parameter name is in Volume Browser, what it calls to calculate um, the, the data for that field. And then the menu text is pretty straightforward. It's the menu text. Um, so you have a contribute over here, and then at the bottom, I'm just going to highlight the complete contribute section. Give it a few seconds to highlight for you. But the contribute section has a start contribute tag with the um, less than, greater than, uh, start and end. And, and at the very end, you have a forward slant contribute to end that contribute menu. So that's the end of your menu there. And so that menu is part of that height pressure uh, that we saw as the first uh, variable menu un under the, the fields area of the volume browser. And so you scroll down in this file, and you see some of the other ones. There's the, the, the temp uh, area. Uh, that's the temp menu for temperatures. In, at least in my system. And then here's moist for uh, moisture is down below a little bit more. And so these are just simply the menus that are in the volume browser. And then again, those keys we'll investigate a little bit further uh, in the talk. And the menu text is whatever you want to put there uh, for your menu text. So pretty easy to, to, uh, to edit these. You just change them, save the file, and uh, reboot your cave. And you should see the change occur. We got HPC guidance there, so that's one of the. So under the miscellaneous um, menu for Volume Browser, now you have all these sub menus, and they all start with a contribute. 
um, and they end with a contribute. Uh, and so you see here HPC guide, uh, and then uh, that's one of my submenus in the TPC guidance, and then we have a, a, another actual sub sub toolbar sub menu toolbar underneath the TPC guidance, which is the T surge plus tide. Um, that would be underneath TPC guidance. So this infrastructure allows you, if you just come in here, and what I typically do is I just pattern it off the patterns I'm seeing, um, and just keep the contribute tags, uh, and add my submenus if I want to submenu certain things or not. The big one is the key. This is where you find out what your derived field or what your field name is. And if you know a one volume browser, many of the field keys are the same, or the parameter names for your field are the same as they were in A1. So they kept a lot of that infrastructure the same. So the keys from A1 transfer to A2. So that helps um, if you have that A1 knowledge, but you certainly don't need it. So what I do is I typically come in here and I, I will put in the menu, what the menu would read um, in my volume browser uh, infrastructure. Like if I chose the field, what was that text? And then I, I just search for that text within this XML file and then can come back to the key value and get the derived parameter and investigate that further. So that's the menu itself and, and how you control that. So you could make a new contribute uh, menu item um, and put certain things into it if you wanted to change that. Okay, so now I'm going back to my PowerPoint slide. And hopefully, since I didn't do anything, this will be through already. You see that fine now? It says, uh, let's open this bad boy, and you're on GFS yeah, land right. station. Okay, so, so under this, you can see that breakout menu that I made. There's our HPC guidance and our TPC guidance uh, from that miscellaneous menu. So those are just those contributes with the, with the uh, submenuing uh, uh, infrastructure there in my contribute statement. Okay, so that's field menus. Those are the fields to, and how you would alter your field menus or rename if you want to put different text in there for naming them. Um, right now I'm working through trying to alphabetize them uh, because the storms menu has become pretty big. Um, so I'm just um, starting to alphabetize some of them so you can rearrange them or make submenus or what have you. So that's how you would do that. So now I'm going to switch over to the planes area, and it's a very similar type of function. Um, uh, we're looking now, though, on the left-hand side, you can see the XML under menus. We're looking at planes, menus, plan view. And, and so I'm, I'm now looking at the VB GUI, and we have pressure and temperature. So I'm going to open up that file, and this time I'm not going to scroll through it. We're just going to bring it up and transmit that to you. Yeah, it popped right up, at least okay. on my end. So as long as I don't scroll, we're good. So there you see the pressure uh, contribute item there and all the different pressures underneath that. And then you also see a submenu of the 10 to 575 millibar levels that are in there. And so you can just make that contribute section uh, and use that submenuing again, pretty straightforward. And again, in this one, you have a key. Uh, so if we just look at the, the top line here under pressure for 100 millibars, um, we have a little bit different item here. It says um, key 100 millibars. So that's the, the plane name or the name of the level. Um, and then text lookup, where it gets its text from is uh, in the level mapping uh, file. And, um, and we'll go into that, and I'll show you how, how that corresponds. But this is the file that controls um, all those different uh, GUI menus that, that you saw on the PowerPoint slide. So you would just come in here, and if you wanted to rearrange it, that would, you could do that, or you could find out what the plane name, uh, the name of the plane or level that you're looking for uh, is within the, the menu system itself. Okay, so now I'm back to um, the localization perspective. And remember that um, the reference within that planes file was to a level mapping file. And that level mapping file contains all your, all your levels. Uh, and in this slide that you're looking at, 
you can see um, I'm pointing uh, at the site level for level mapping file.xml. And now that's under the D2D volume browser folder on the localization on the left side. And that file contains on the right hand side all of the different um, all the different levels and layers that are in your system. And so I'm going to call that o open. Um, maybe what I'll do before I leave, actually I will, I'll just open that file up. I'm a little bit snake bit. I don't want to scroll too much and hang you guys, hang us up in some never, never land again. Okay, so you okay, should now be wait. looking at that level mapping file. Do you see that, John? Not quite yet. We're still seeing okay. the prior one you had up there. And it's coming up. Okay, it's up now. Okay, so here is the level mapping file. And so this contains all the levels and layers that are in your system. And there's a bunch of different variables here. Um, some of them are important. Some of them are not so important. Um, but they have a bunch of variables within this level mapping. And so what you do is you make these uh, level entries. And I'm just going to highlight um, the first one you see there. But you can see it starts with a level, and it ends with a forward slash level. So that is one entry. Uh, and then you see the different things in there. In this case, the key uh, equals ML. So that's what it would be referred to in the menu. That would be what the, if the menu has an ML in there, and that's for the mixed layer, um, it would call this, this uh, calculation uh, area and, and map to this, this calculation line. Um, so the level group equals C means it's a composite, means it's a layer. Uh, and if we continue across that first line, display name, ML, and then in parentheses, 0 to 1 kilometer. So I put in a mixed layer in there, and the display name is ML. But I've also, for clarity for the forecasters, put in parentheses, 0 to 1 kilometers. That's what's going to display in your volume browser menu, uh, that display name. Um, and then you go down to the second highlighted line there, the database level. And you can see the unit there is in meters. And um, on the very right side of that, it says level nam name FHAG, which stands for fixed height above ground. Um, and then in meters, we've got level 1 value and level 2 value. And so we've got a C for a composite level group variable. So that means it's a layer. Um, and the two levels defining the layer are 0 meters above ground, fixed height above ground level, and 1,000 meters above ground level. And so this is just giving me my 0 to 1 kilometer or 0 to 1,000 meter mixed layer. So that's what, how we define that plane uh, in the level mapping. So it, you have to make an entry in here if you want to make a new uh, plane. So maybe you decide you want to look at, um, I don't think we maybe have like, um, for let's say low level wind shear. Um, and we want to make a um, 0 to 2,000 foot layer, for example. You would have to ensure that you have the 1,000 foot, or I'm sorry, the 2,000 foot layer uh, level in there. Um, and um, if we look, let's see here, I'm scared I don't want to scroll here too much. Um, let me see if I can get to something fairly close. Yeah, I'm scrolling down just a, just a few clicks, and that should come through. And then I'm going to just highlight 100 millibars here. And John, could you just tell me when you have that highlighted? OK, it's highlighted. OK, so the group here is S. Um, which means it's a single level uh, versus the C, which was a composite plane. So it's a single level plane. And here you see I'm, my level name now is millibars, and my one level is 100. So it's 100 millibars, pretty straightforward. The units are um, hectopascals. Um, so you can see that it's pretty straightforward code. Um, so if I'm doing like a um, 0 to 2,000 foot, uh, and I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be using millibars here. I'd be using that. Um, uh, fixed height above ground level or what have you. But I'd look down to look at where my 
um, thousand foot levels were in this file, which is scrolled further down, which I, I can't do because I don't want to kill our join me. Um, but I would add in that S, S value group for a single layer, make sure my 2000 was in there. Um, and then I would make a C group um, and follow the nomenclature that we saw up above with the mix layer, and I would make it um, level 1 would be 0 and level 2 would be 2000. Um, and you could make a, a, a 0 to 2000 foot layer or something like that if you want to look at like low level wind shear, let's say. Um, so the big idea here is that the level mapping file is what really controls all your planes in your system. It is the base infrastructure for, for levels and layers in your infrastructure. And uh, it's what's called by the v volume browser GUI, this file. Um, and so if you come in here and you just mess around and look at some of the, the, the code and nomenclature, you can kind of follow it pretty straightforward uh, in a pretty straightforward manner. Hey Dan, quick question. Sure. Um, in that file you were just showing, you had one entry, uh, I think it was for surface, but yet there were two lines underneath it. Like um, one was SFC and one was MSL. Does that? Yep. Yeah, so, um, you're right, right. So, yeah, depending on the data set um, and how it's sh how the model the, some, some of the models have certain variables that are a little bit different. But what that basically says is the surface can be defined as um, um, as a, a true level coming in from the model named surface, or if it's named MSL. So some some of the weird things like LAP sometimes has that um, has a different definition for a level but it's still the surface. Um, and so you can put additional entries under here that will match surface, the surface key. So if you want them to map, basically we're mapping the MSL level name um, to the surface here. And so you can put different, different items under that if you, if you want to, to um, alias, if you will, those other names to surface. I think we had this issue with, well, I can't remember back, but in the baseline there was some problem with displaying, uh, boy, freezing level data or zero Celsius, and, and I don't know if it was laps that couldn't find the zero C or something, in it, and we had to map like freezing level to zero C, or I had to add one in here to fix the baseline so that it displayed. So the bottom line here is if you put in more database levels, those are just aliases to map to surface. Any other questions to this point? Okay, so now I'm going back to the localization perspective and, and just for, for training pur purposes, we can just look at one of these entries here. Uh, the one that, I, that is highlighted in the, in the text there um, on the screen. Um, is the one to seven kilometer AGL layer. And that's very similar to what we were looking at kind of for that mixed layer. So my display name, what's gonna, what is going to be displayed in my volume browser GUI is one to seven kilometers AGL. And my key, uh, or what the plane name will be is one to seven kilometer AGL. So that's the key that um, would have to be in the volume browser GUI. Um, under that. And the group is C, so it's a composite, meaning it's a layer. Um, and then you look at that database level entry, it says FHAG, so fixed height above ground. Level 1 value is 1,000, uh, and the units are meters, as you can see on the third line. So the level 1 value is 1,000, level 2 value is 7,000. So I've defined, I believe most of these in here, a good portion of them I had to add. I think they were missing from the baseline. Um, this section of the file with some of these strange um, different layers in there. So you just make them. They're pretty straightforward. I just copy and paste and follow the nomenclature usually of what's in that file already, and uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward.
Any questions on the planes before we move on? So the key, the key if you're writing code in, once you get into doing fields, and you're writing code to, to, to make a field, the key is what you'd key, <laughs> the key is what you'd use in your derived parameters that we're going to get to next um, to, to reference a plane. So that, that key is what you would reference. The display name is simply what's used in the volume browser. So the key is what's important both in fields and in planes. Okay, so we've we've knocked off a couple of the uh, items in the outline so far. Uh, next, we're going to work on uh, fields and derived parameters to show you how to track down where the volume browser uh, from, like the volume browser GUI into the derived parameters, and then how to edit a derived parameter. Okay, so now I've switched frames to uh, back to the XML directory under menus. On the left hand side, you see we're editing a field, the field menus file, which is the volume browser fields um, GUI. And I showed you this, this is the file we got hung up on before um, using IE just to display it, but I'm, I'm just using the localization perspective here in the screen. Um, so we see that, um, for example, in the center of the screen where I have my arrow, I'm just pointing to an entry there. Um, that's the height pressure you can see from the first contribute line um, that we've got a height pressure title on that menu item. And then below it are all my height and pressure entries. And you can see here now I've alphabetized my entries. That's the menu text items that are all lined up there. So you can see they're in alphabetical order. Um, so each of those items has a key, and um, that key is actually the name of the derived parameter XML file. So we're going to take that next step and look at what the contents are of like a 0 to 5. In this one, I've highlighted the height with the arrow, the T minus 5 day mean for height, um, and the key there is 0 to 5. Um, we're not going to investigate that one exactly, but in the next slide, I'm going to make the uh, make the connection for you. Um, so that's the field menu. So I maybe go into this file and search for my field name that I want to that I want to research, um, and look for the key. And once I got the key, then I can go into the derived parameters and look what the code is that that calculates that. Like for example, zero to five, uh, that key item there. Okay. So now under the D2D. Um, I've switched slides here to um, open up the D2D folder. Remember, there's a cave folder and a D2D folder. And under D2D here, um, we've got a Derive Parameters folder. And so when you open Derive Parameters, you see all on the left-hand side here, you've got all these XMLs. And all those are doing calculations. They're either a, a key from a field that's called. So you see my third arrow down there on the left has a 0 to 5.xml. So that's, that's the f file that holds the code for 0 to 5xml, or that holds the code to calculate that um, t minus 5 day mean height. So all these XML files in here are either called by the key that we found in the menus, or they're called internally by each other. You can actually write one of these, the 0 to 5 XML actually calls two or three, I can't remember exactly, calls two or three other XMLs that are in derived parameters to do some of the mathematics and calculations. Okay, so that's where the code resides. All right, so let's look a little bit at one of these parameters. Here's the, um, what I've looked at here is the ML LCL .xml file. So on one of our first uh, menus uh, we saw for the planes was the mixed layer LCL definition for the plane, for ML plane. Um, but now what I've done is I've actually opened up um, an, the ML LCL .xml, uh, uh derived parameter. 
So each of these derived parameters um, contains a calculation very similar to what if you did A1 work, this would be your virtual field table.txt. Um, you know, it's synonymous with that. And each of these is broken out into its own file. Um, so the important ones here is that, the, that in the calculation of these is that there's a method entry. And each of these method entries calls a function. It may be a mathematical function or a test function that you see in the second black arrow, uh, where it ingests a field and does something with it. And so that's what the name is equal to. And a list, just like we actually have the A1, and, and like I said, a lot of the keys, the key names from A1 migrated to A2, and a good many of the functions that you could do mathematically in A1 have translated into A2, and they've also added some in A2. Um, so these are what I would call, quote unquote, canned um, methods or functions to do work on a field. Uh, and you can go into the, um, the same one we used in A1, AWIPS FXA localization uh, documentation grid tables.htm file, and look at those functions. Um, and the only problem I have is that at the very bottom um, of that file is where all the functions reside. And at the cost of scrolling through that entire file and hanging us up again, I am not going to open that file and scroll through it. I can open it up um, and let you view it. Uh, so you can see the this is the grid tables file. Do you see that, John? Sure do, Dan. Okay. So I'm not going to scroll down here, but at the very end of this file, um, there's a list of functions, uh, all the mathematical functions that you can use. But there are also other ones in A2. And, and Dale, I don't know if those are documented anywhere. I don't know if you have knowledge of the documentation on all the functions in A2. Um, well, um, what what I was was going to say is, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, where where you've got the uh, the derived parameters lo loaded up, and under derived parameters here, you've got three different folders in in analyzation perspective. One of them is de definitions, where 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 all these parameters are defined. The next folder down under that's functions, and they're all listed there. There. They're they're all Python files, um, so so if, if, even that the basic one like multi multiply here, there's a multiply.py in there uh, that 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 shows what that fun function is. So yeah, so that's that's a nice um, that's a nice addition, Dale. Thanks. So my idea would be use the grid tables as kind of an idea on what some of these do, because the grid tables documentation file tells you what the, what the function's meant to do. Um, and you may not be able to gather that from the folder. And you can't see the folder here on the left-hand side. It's like Dale said, it's underneath definitions. Um, and it contains those PY files that do the mathematics. So each of these, like te it would, there would be a test.py, a multiply.py. Um, and that has raw Python code on doing, doing the math. But I'm not sure how much you would necessarily get out of it from some of these complex co computations. So, so I guess between the two, um, looking at that, that functions folder and looking at this, this um, grid tables documentation, you can maybe piece together what's available. But there's also, you can also look at these XML files and see some of the functions that are available there. Um, so that just gives you some, some resource material. Uh, and also, the big thing here, too, is this is where you find out what the native units are in, in, this, in this display parameter. So this is an ML uh, LCL height. Um, its abbreviation is the key. So this ML LCL is, is what would show up in your, um, in your volume browser um, menu. Uh, to display it. And then the units here are in meters. So the default is meters. And that, caused, that can cause problems for people, right, if you don't want to look at it always in meters. Same thing with freezing level. The freezing level is, is a height parameter. 
um, at the freezing level was in the default as meters. So we're, we're going to get to changing that um, in a bit here. Okay, so kind of putting this all together, uh, let's, let's just kind of go along the track that we want to just see how we define the mixed layer LCL, what the units are, and, and what the layer is. The first thing you want to do is go to the field menus XML file, and that's the one, the volume browser GUI file. Okay, so I'm going to bring that up. And you go into this file, and again, it's your, it's your, all your menu items. So you look for uh, LCL or mixed layer LCL and find out what the key is for that parameter. Um, and at the expense of, again, scrolling on this one, I'm not going to go to the, um, actually, yeah, I, I don't want to hang it up, but we could go down to mix, we could go down and search this file for LCL and then uh, extract the key from it. And I can tell you what the key is. Um, it's, it's MLLCL is the key. And so we check out that MLLCL.XML derived parameter like we were just looking at. So then you can come in here and look at all the different um, information in here to see how it's calculated. So let's kind of run through this file here. Uh, the units are in meters as we talked about. The first method in here uh, uh, uses a surface, it just defines the levels as surface, um, and it multiplies the surface uh, level here. We do um, this method here, the levels just defines what the variable ML, LCL at the surface would be, and we're going to multiply the next two fields. Actually, the next X number of fields are going to be multiplied together. Um, so the next entry is this field. It's going to be a field we're going to multiply. Uh, we're going to use the level ML, which is we know is the 0 to 1 kilometer uh, layer. And we're going to do it for DPD. And um, what you would do is go back, if you don't know what DPD means, you could go back to the, the field menus and simply search for DPD and uh, see that it's the dew point depression. Um, and that's the key for dew point depression. So what are we doing here? We're just going to multiply the dew point depression um, for a mixed layer for that 0 to 1 kilometer layer. That's our plane we're going to um, multiply by 120. Okay, so why 120? Well, there's an this is an approximation for LCL height uh, that's in the glossary of meteorology that's published by the AMS. So right away, you can see that this MLLCL is not a vertical calculation of the mixed layer LCL. We're not doing any parcel lifting. It's an approximation value uh, where we're, we're multiplying in meters, 120 meters times the dew point depression to get an approximation on the mixed layer LCL height. Okay, so let's go to the next method and see what happens. And these are processed. Um, these are processed um, by the system, so each of them is tagged. So what I mean by tagged is if whatever your levels are is your tag for that um, for tag for that, that field. So I have MLLCL being calculated in this first calculation for surface. So it would be defined as MLLCL at the surface. This next one we're going to do is going to be the MLLCL at, at, for a mixed layer. Okay, so what we're going to do there is the name here is test. Um, so we're going to use a, a function that's, that tests input from some field. So we can test it, and if it falls within a certain range, we can assign it a value. Um, this is typically how icons are assigned. If it falls within a certain range, you give it an icon value uh, of whatever freezing rain. If it falls into another one, you give it rain. Um, so in this one, we're going to just test the heights of the MLLCL. And I'm not going to go um, back to the grid tables.htm, which is at, listed on the bottom of this slide, but that grid tables.html would tell you exactly what each of these variables, variables would be within the test function. Um, but I'll tell you and explain what this, what this little function does here. 
you have this hey, test. Hey, Dan. Yeah, go ahead. If, if I could interject there just for a minute. I, I've found that uh, most of the, uh, the Python functions that Dale referred to earlier, like test.py, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they, they have been documented. They, they have pretty good comments in them. So you, I'm just saying you don't necessarily need to go to the AWIPS1 grid tables .html file for a description of that if you okay. open test.py in your localization perspective. And then you can have it right there in a tab uh, side by side. And even after reading the documentation for test.py, I would love for someone to describe to me what it actually does. But that's, that's neither here nor there. Yeah, so again, you have two references there. So Matt was referring to the functions folder that's under derived parameters that has all the, the raw PY functions that calculate the different items. And I haven't gone into a lot of those, um, but um, as Matt describes, there is some documentation in there, um, and then there is some also some documentation from the A1. And, and, um, and yeah, A1 is a little bit different code, but it gives you maybe some of the idea of what's happening with that function. So, so in this case, we're just going to test um, a field, and, and one of the, the first inp input variable here on this line is field level surface MLCL. So what I'm doing here is we're actually calling um, the MLCL, which is this file, but with the surface tag. And so that's what, what it's calling is this input. So whatever was calculated within this upper tag or within this upper method is what we're calling to test on. And so I will just tell you that the next few variables, I'll just go through it with you. The first, this first constant variable is if it's a 1, it says if, if this MLCL surface variable falls between 0 and 500, then assign it this fourth variable. So the 1 just says look at the next two values. If it falls in between it, assign it to the fourth. So what we're doing here is if it's between 0 and 500 meters, based on the dew point depression times 120. So if the ML LCL is between 0 and 500 meters, just assign it 500 meters. Okay? That's kind of a, basically we're implementing a lower limit to the ML LCL. So maybe you, were, maybe you were looking at LCL or a forecaster was looking at it and saying, you know, there's never any values less than 500 meters in the LCL field. Why is that occurring? Well, if you look in the, under the hood, if you will, you can tell you can see that because of this test parameter, it limits it to 500 meters as a lower threshold. Um, and then you have another section here, which is, again, the value of 1. So these are, in, these are in groups of 4. So this is the next test, and it says, again, look at the next two parameters. And if it falls, if these values of MLCL that are calculated in the above method fall into this these, this range, then we're going to assign something else. So the second and third here are 501. So if it falls between 501 meters and basically 1 e to the 37th, or infinity, if you will, anything over 501, then we're going to assign it the value that was calculated from the MLCL at the surface. Okay, so that above, that method from above, the contents of that method above will fall into now. Um, this parameter. So when we display ML LCL at the ML level, the mixed layer, it's going to have a 500 lower threshold, and the values will anything over 501 will be the true values of the calculation of the above of the top method. So that's kind of how that's processed, and I know that's a little bit more advanced, and it's only one Python function, the test. Um, of, of dozens of different functions you can do, but it kind of gives you some idea on how this all works. And again, we can look at what that ML is defined at, again, from that level mapping file. And for ease sake, I'm glad I did use this ML definition. There's the key. Do you have the the file contents up, John? Yes, it uh, has height, dot, 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 pressure. Dot, oh, here we go. Yes, yeah, level mappings? Yep. Okay, that's it. 
We got it. Okay, so the first entry there, again, the ML is what we looked at earlier with that level mappings file. So you can see what it's actually defined as, and that's 0 to 1,000 meters as we went through before. Uh, so that's where you get that definition. Questions before I leave this slide? So we've gone through the, the top three outline ideas, and again, this is an introductory introductory type of type of training. I just want to try to give you a taste for where these things are located and give you some reference on building your own infrastructure in A2. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to answer or lead you down all the um, you know, rosy paths to uh, knowledge here today. I can only do so much in this amount of time. But let's move on to color tables and where some of that information lies. Um, this is a pretty important one for customizing your station or your, your user profile, whatever you want to do. Um, so under the cave uh, directory here, we have a folder called style rules. And sometime back, Matt Foster put out a note on um, a, a nice strategy to edit these, these files. The big ones that you're going to be using here in the style rules are, uh, for the volume browser fields at least, are the arrow style rules, D2D arrow style rules. These are the black arrows. So the black arrows show you the D2D arrow style rules, the contour style rules, and then a little bit further down is the grid imagery style rules file. And so what I do now with Matt made the finding that you could rename those or put your local additions into a local uh, appending the word. Or you can really append anything on the front that you want. I put local on the front of them. Um, and you can put your, your parameters that you want to change into those files. So you just keep the base file, and then you have this local file sitting at the site level. So you first start making the changes on the user level, make sure that your changes look good, and then you just um, add all your customization into these local files, and it makes it a nice, um, neat way to do that. So those are the three. So if you want to edit your arrow, the way the arrows display, you go into the arrow styles, all the contouring. Um, is done in that contour style rules. And then for your color tables and images, um, that grid imagery style rules. You can see if you worked in A1, it's got some of that A1 flavor to the file naming structure. So let's just look a little bit at that uh, my local grid imagery style rules file and, and look at some of the nuts and bolts under the hood there. Hey Dan, can I can I add a comment real quick on those style rules files? You bet. Uh, basically, what I found was that the code sources in. Um, actually, it, can can you easily flip back to that picture of the localization perspective? Yes. Okay. What I found is is the code sources in star arrow style rules star contour style rules, and star imagery style rules, .xml in all those cases. So you, know, you, you could have, you know, you could have a, a file called Matt's Really Awesome Imagery Style Rules, .xml, and it would get sourced in right along with all the other imagery style rules. The other interesting note of that is that uh, if you think about that, it means that grid imagery style rules, radar imagery style rules, satellite imagery style rules, all those style rules get, get sourced in together into a single map. AWIPS 2 doesn't really care if it's displaying a grid image or a radar image or a satellite image. It's just an image. And as, as Dan goes into the, the details of the style rules, uh, you'll see with the with the parameter name matching how it decides uh, what to apply that to. 
the other point of that is I'm <clears throat> I've attempted to determine in the code how a, a rule match if if you have two rules that match to the same parameter which one gets applied and and maybe Dan maybe you've figured that out I'm not a hundred percent clear if it if it's the first one that's encountered or the last one that's encountered but uh, that that was the main thing I, w I wanted to, to add there so so go on where you were yeah so so just kind of repeating what Matt said there in a nutshell if you just keep that that um, that portion of the file name and you can put anything else you want to I just chose local um, but the important thing here Matt and correct me if I'm wrong is that we keep those at the site level um, and then we we don't do anything with those other files that are the base level we have to keep those there to have that infrastructure work correctly isn't that right you can't have a site <coughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, I'm sorry. I was just clearing my throat. I, I should have muted. No. Go ahead. Go ahead and finish what you were saying. Yeah. If you have your D2D contour style rules, the second black arrow there, and you have a site file there, it's not going to work correctly. Well, it it can. Um, the what what I have found with with those files is it is. Um, I'm trying to remember what the nomenclature was from A1. It, it's basically a full override. So if if you override D2D contour style rules, you have to copy the entire file. And and li like I was saying, it's it's unclear to me still at this point, having been you know messing around with with AWIPS2 for years, how those style rules override each other and th this is something that I've asked uh, Raytheon for clarification on a number of times and I've tried to track it down through the through the source code and and it, it's a seriously deep rabbit hole to dive down to try and try and trace what's happening um, but what I do know is um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I actually shouldn't say that, that I know any of, of, of the stuff regarding override. And, and overrides are important because a lot of times there's a style applied in the baseline that we want to change on a particular parameter and figuring out how AWIPS2 applies the styles. When, like I said, when you have two styles, that match the same parameter, I'm still not 100% clear what it does with that. Right. So, I, and I'm, I am not either, but I can tell you this is the best success I've had is, is you keep the D2D, um, the three arrow files that I have de uh, marked here uh, at the base level. Okay. And then you put your entries into a site level with a local whatever appendage or whatever appendage you want to put on that, um, and that is the site level file. That is the best luck I've had at having those style rules override the base. Okay, because but, uh, there are yeah. different things you're going to freezing level in the base is in meters, and you're going to want to have that same entry just change the units to feet. Probably that was okay. one of the biggest requests. I think that was on the A2 list, uh, A2 dev um, early on. So okay, well, I, I should I should just let you go ahead. I I think you have probably messed with style rules a little bit more than I have. So you go ahead and explain to us what you found because it, it it sounds like you you might have a better approach than than what I've been doing. So so let's go look at this this grid imagery style rules, um, the local file that that I maintain and. Um, Unfortunately, I, you know, at the cost of, of, um, yeah, at the cost of scrolling, I think what we're going to do here is just look at some of the entries that that are in my file. And and again, um, when I first started looking at these entries, they looked foreign to me. But the more and more you work with them, it becomes pretty straightforward. 
Now, I will say that there's some interesting items that are still hanging out there in the code where you may, may change some of these parameters we're going to talk about, and you may not get the, the, the right outcome. And, and sometimes that's, I, and I come back to Matt Foster on these, and he'll say, well, yeah, this looks like a bug in, in, in the way it's handling that, that level or that layer. So um, be aware of that, but most, most things work in these files. So, okay, so within the, the uh, my grid imagery style uh, file, the, the big thing is that we have these XML demarcations here where these style rule tags are start and stop uh, with the forward slash style rules. So you start it with a style rule, you end it with a forward slash style rule. And then the contents within that, uh, within those markers, uh, give you all your variables. So there's a few different things here. Um, we start at the top. Um, let's go down to the second. I'm going to close the first entry. And we're going to look at the second entry. It has a little bit more applicability, I think. Um, OK, so um, hopefully you're, you're caught up here. Um, and we're going to look at the style rule entry here in the PARM level matches. And this is where the parameter key comes in. Um, and, and we've looked at those keys from, uh, from the volume browser. So the key for the field is P here. So pressure is what we're keying in on. And this is where we're, just, we're trying to match the field and the levels that we want to apply an image style to. And image style can mean what does your color bar range look like? Um, what displays your color range? What's the default color map that we use? Uh, what are the units that display in that, uh, for that field? So what we're trying to do is match here in this first section, this PARM level matches. And I'll highlight that. Again, it's got an open tag and a closed tag. And what we're just trying to do there is match um, a parameter key or a field. That's what parameter is. So P is pressure. It's the key for pressure. Um, and you can just leave that parameter in there. It would be, uh, if you just left the parameter P, it would, it would color anything, any pressure uh, analysis that you did, it would have this, this applied to it. But what we're going to do is use the range level in this case to give it uh, some different, some different um, specificity, if you will. So range level units here, the units we're using is th are theta. So this is going to be on the theta surfaces. So it's for isentropic plotting of pressure. So we're, for the pressure plots on isentropic levels, for levels of theta from 250 to 350, that's the upper and lower. And then we close the range level and close the parameter matches. So any time that I call up a theta, uh, an isentropic surface from 250 to 350, and I want to plot pressure on top of it, the following image style will apply. So now we look at that image style tag. Again, it starts with the image style open tag, and then you have the, the forward slash image style closing that tag. So this is where you can change units. Uh, so display units is a pretty popular one. And the beauty of AWIPS 2 is you don't have to jump through conversions of units. Um, the system internally knows uh, the mathematics and knows the units that you're, you're sending around and will auto-convert those. As long as you use the display units that match what, what the system knows as units. So in this case, um, it's going to display units of, of millibars. But if I wanted to do, say, freezing level, I could put feet in there, even though, or, or MLLCL, since we're using that as an example. Remember, the units for that were M, uh, were meters. And so if I just put display units in here for MLLCL of, of uh, FT, I would, it would auto-convert it to feet. I don't have to do any of the mathematics behind that, um, which is nice. It really saves a step. Uh, so in this case, display units gives where you change the unit, uh, the range. So this is the, the scale that uh, for your color bar on the top left of your display. It's going to go from 100 to 1,000. And then the default color map, that's one of my color maps, wind speed, wind speed dash TC. And I'll, I'll show you how you get the name of that. But that's where you set 
Um, any image now that I display with pressure on a theta level uh, will have that color map assigned to it, that wind speed, wind speed dash TC. And that's the next uh, portion of the training here is how you get that, that name and how you, how you uh, throw that into the file. And then just the color bar incrementing is the next one. It's, it's going to show every 100 um, millibars in this case. So we're going from uh, 100 millibars to 1,000 millibars, and we're going to have an increment every 100 millibars on that color band that's up on the top, that legend. So I did two scrolls, and I'm going to highlight. I just wanted to show you some of the other entries in there. So John, if you could just tell me once you see the highlighting come on, you'll see GH uh, towards the top of the screen. Yep, there you go. OK, so, so in this case, this is just another rule entry. And I've got GH here for my parameter, which is geopotential height. And what's interesting here, if you just, again, what I did was to learn the system more, I just went into these files and looked at all the different variables that were in these entries already in the, in the base file. Um, so in this case, we have a creating entity, uh, which is your model source data set. Um, so here we have HRR East and HRR West. So this style will only be applied for geopotential height. Um, there's also ZAGL in there for a parameter that ZAGL is height uh, above ground level. So it's um, not geopotential height, but height above ground. So I've got both of those. Um, and then a smooth geopotential height, that's GHXSM. And how do I know all those? Well, I've worked with the Volume Browser for a number of years. But if I wanted to look those up, I'd go back to that field menu from the, VB, uh, from the Volume Browser GUI and, and look those up and see what they corresponded to. And there's still a number of fields that I have to do that for. Um, but again, it's just finding out what the key is and, and what the menu name is so you can understand what, what field we're getting at there. So this will only be displaying for all geopotential height and height AGL for the HRR east and west in this case. Um, the image style entry in the second half, I'll just highlight that, uh, will be applied. So it tells you the display units for kilometers. Um, so everything will be displayed in kilometers there. Um, and the grid, gridded data is the uh, default color map on that one. So that kind of talks about what that image style file is. Now, if you go into contours, um, it's very similar in its structure. It just is missing some of the, it doesn't have like a default color map entry. Um, and it has some different, one, different entries, like, um, um, like if you want to make contours, give it contour values uh, to contour every certain amount, like an increment, or actual values. It has some of that information in there. I'm not going to go through that. Um, just to kind of keep this a little bit more brief. But you kind of get a feel for how you can go in and change these maps. So let me show you then how to go into some of the color maps uh, in, in, and, and, and how you get that assign, assignment made. Now, this is uh, the, um, the cave menu and color maps. I've opened up that color maps folder. Going to talk a little slow. Make sure you all are with me on the on the training or on the webinar. So I've opened up the color maps folder, and one of the things I've done is organize my color maps in folders. And I would say that the probably the easiest way to do that is to go into the um, environment and not the localization perspective, and and um, make folders um, underneath the color maps directory. Um, and move your color maps around if they're not organized right now. Uh, but what I did was made these folders so that they were a little bit easier to find and a little more intuitive. And so when, when our, my forecasters go into, uh, to go into site level for a color map, they can see that these different folders exist and find their color map a little bit easier. Um, so I've highlighted LCL only on the left-hand side because I was using that as an example, and I was going to scroll down and show you how we have set that within uh, that color map 
setting within the file. But um, let me see if let me just check one thing and see if I can get back. Okay, you're going to probably be moving around a little bit. I had to check something to see if I could give you an example. But remember, in the color default color map, I had, um, and these are all at the site level. So if I would open up um, these folders, that you would see the color map names like LCL height is highlighted here. And if you open up that arrow again under LCL height, you'd see a site underneath that. They can be user, they can be site, but my color tables here are for the site level. Um, and so we, we saw wind speed uh, in that color map entry for uh, pressure on the theta surface. We saw wind speed slash wind speed dash TC. And so the wind speed was actually my folder name. And unfortunately, I can't scroll down here uh, to show you the wind speed directory. But um, I could have very easily changed that color map entry to LCL forward slash LCL space height to make the LCL height color map uh, assigned to the pressure on theta surfaces. So that's where that comes in if you want to set up default color maps and ranges. So I've done that with my entire system um, you know, uh, and, and made those entries for images especially uh, because I've defined the ranges for front of genesis so that the scale is not moving for every storm that comes in and every display, I have a fixed scale and I have a fixed color map that's defaulted in there. Now, it doesn't mean your staff can't change those. It just means that if you loaded Front of Genesis from the volume browser into a pane, it would come up with my default setting. That's the system default setting. If the forecaster wants to come in there and change the color and save it to a procedure, that's, that's up to them. They can totally do that and have that flexibility. But every system, or I'm sorry, every field in my system has a relevant scale to display and a relevant image color, uh, uh, color map assigned to it that's relevant, basically, that, that is meteorologically useful. Hey, Dan, a quick question on that. Um, could you, for example, define a color map for 850 temps and a different one for 500 temps? Yes, exactly. And so what you'd have to do is just make two style rule entries. And um, let me try to let me try to do this and show you where you would how you would do that. We can go back to our uh, our example. For theta, I'm going to highlight it. And tell me when you see the highlighting. Matt, you can just tell me when, once you see that highlighted. Yep, I can see it now. OK. So in that one, we would make the parameter uh, T for temp instead of P. We'd change our range level units equal to MB for millibars. And you could gather that information by just looking at some of the other entries in there. You know, there's a ton of entries in that, that file in the baseline. So you, you pretty quickly can learn what you need to put in there for the variable name. My range level units would be MB instead of theta. And then my um, single, you'd actually have a, a single value. I think it's um, the parameter there. Yeah, if you look above it at the first style rule entry for trope, see it says single level units there, it would be that's what your, how your entry would read. It would say single level units equal MB, and then the value would be below it. So you'd put like 850 in there. OK. And then down below, you'd put the color map that you want for 850. And then right below it, you'd duplicate that entry and just change 850 to 500 and put a different color map in there that you want for 500. Yeah, we've done that, like, especially our low level temperatures. We've done you know, a surface temperature and then like a 925 and an 850. Uh, color curve, and then I think 700 and above have like a, I don't know, some some kind of a interpolated scheme that are all the same. But it, it's pretty simple, I think, to get to where you want to go.
Any other questions? Hey, Dan. Yeah. Um, the question I have for you is mainly the organization of your image curves because I've got to do something here with that, and I've just kind of I know that you've taken that directory approach. Did you, when you switched over, did you just have everyone? Uh, did you have that moved around so that people could just latch on to those images and their procedures? Uh, and how are how are you managing all that with uh, the different ways forecasters can or whoever can save images? Because it's becoming a nightmare, honestly. Right, right. And when remember the user, the I guess the way that the, there, there's somewhat of a control on the clutter because everyone that all the forecasters when they save their image curve, it's always done under their user profile. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah, the images can become a nightmare. Um, and I have so, that. oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just I just manage it that from a site level. And it doesn't affect their users, the user level, um, usually, um, from what I found. I, I made that. Now, what you could do is if you feel like um, some of those are referenced not in folders, what you could do is just copy them instead. It would clean you up to the folder level. You know what I'm saying? Because what, yeah. right now, if I open color maps on your system, you wouldn't see any of those folders. You just see every single every single color map alphabetically listed. And so there might be some, and Matt, maybe take this in um, with your brain power and see if I'm saying this right, but there might be some people that are mapped to that color curve that's sitting where it's sitting without a folder. And if you would move it into a folder named Ken, it might screw up the mapping that's in a procedure. And I'm not sure on that. So what I did was I copied. I just made the folders and copied the files in there to make yeah, sure does. that I didn't interrupt those linkages. Yeah. Matt, I don't know if you have anything to say on that that would help me there. Me? Matt, maybe off the call, I don't know. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 still here. It, I'm I'm sorry, I got distracted on something. Okay, else. never mind. I so Ken, that's how I did it. Um but you could probably test a few of them. Oh, I don't know, yeah, somehow it, yeah. write a procedure it, and it, uh it, have it use yeah. one of them and then move it and see what happened. But um well, I I, I really like that we made now. those folders and um it really makes it a lot more usable and easy to find different things. Yeah, it does drop it off. They can't see it. Their procedure, what have you, won't see it. If they go into the XML file in their procedure, they can edit it and change it or resave their procedure or what have you. But yeah, it won't follow them. And so that's kind of the conundrum I'm in now. Um, the other thing I've noticed is that when you go in and you rescale some of the, uh, like if you have a, say if I put a, um, You'll just use Matt's example of wanting to do an, an 850 temperature or what have you, and I put a scale on it. And if they already have a procedure built, that procedure overrides your default scaling. And I don't know if that was the same in AWIPS 1. I always thought that you could override, if you had the default, that their procedure would adjust to that, but I can't remember. But that's something to be aware of. Yeah, and it, maybe it, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it points to the idea that you take some of these settings and stick them into your system and try to get them in as fast as possible so that the rebuilding process uses that that default. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Hey, hey Dan. Yeah. Um, I just had a question. You know, back when we converted over back last August, um, we had seen Matt's note about the uh, base and all that stuff with the uh, image rules. And so we yeah. created a file called FSD instead of local. Of course, then we installed your filing browser, and it, you know, it has local. And I'm just curious if you or Matt or anyone has any idea how that handles having, you know, having the base of, you know, like grid image style rules, and then an FSD image grid image style rules, and then a local image style rules. You know, I hope I'm making that clear. Yeah. So Matt talked a little bit earlier about how it pulls in all those, and it pulls them all in uh, as long as they have that. Um, I think Matt said it was grid image style rules or image style rules. I can't remember what Matt said exactly. As long as it has that central 
central file name to it. It'll pull all those in. I think what Matt and I are still confused about is what the hierarchy on those if you had an entry in each one of the files that you described, you have three separate entries for 500 millibar heights and the color table that's associated with it. Which one wins? I don't think we still know that. Um, I've had very good success with having one base and um, one local file. Now, if you want to take your items and put them into my file, the, I, I add uh, my entries from the bottom, but I, I don't. I don't think you need to add the entries at the bottom of those files to have them the last one taken. Um, but anyway, I I don't know. It. I guess that's for you to determine with your three files to see which. You know, maybe do some testing and figure out which one takes. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, right now it appears our FSD is taking, but I kind of un uncomfortable. I think we're going to have to combine them up. But I was just curious. If anyone had an idea how they were interacting with each other. So, well, thanks. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Greg briefed me on what you were talking about before, and we're like 99% sure that if you move those color maps to a subdirectory, you're going to break everything that, that refers to them, in a, you know, any pr uh, procedure bundle or anything like that that referred to them in their old location is going to break. Right. I wonder if you could make a link. You, you could just probably, you, you might be able to do that. I, I, I would avoid that if at all possible. Symbolic links tend to start making things messy. Yeah, okay. But I, I mean, if, if you wanted to do that as an interim uh, and, until you can get everything which of course, I know I say that, and then people make the symbolic links, and then they just never go away. Uh, but I would definitely consider that as just an interim solution until you can, you know, formally switch it to the the, the fixed location. I would think after everything getting so long and so big that everybody would eventually want consolidation, so then you could probably ease it in to combine them into better directories. Yeah. Just not that easy with all the different procedures you have on a station. Any other questions? Uh, it's kind of getting late here. Um, the, the what? One thing I would, would would say about that is that if if you at least knew knew where all the procedures were and and at, at least now that that are XML files that, that they're easily searchable, so um, so you could could grep for grep for for the uh, color table names and 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 then know if they 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 were all moved over or not. So so there's a, there's at least a way to check up on them now that that would have been a lot harder to to do in AWIPS one. So. Yep. Yeah, that's true. If you're a little bit more advanced there and you can work the Linux system a little bit, go into those um, that procedure area, and because it's all just text, um, just work through that and uh, and and like like Dale says, grep for that that color string and color map setting and see if it's in there, and you'd know the people that were affected by it at least. And, and how much of a reach that that color table had at your office. Okay, so it's it's 11:30. I've been going on an, an hour and a half here. Um, I've got one section left. Sh should I do this? Should I wait till another training? Um, I guess. Um, do you have any feeling for that? Mm. I'm talking to the crowd, I guess. Uh, or about how long um, do you think it would be, Dan? Um, I think we could go through this in about 10 minutes or so. And I'll just do a speed version on it. And I guess if you want to drop, if you're on the call and you want to drop off, I understand it's not a big deal. Um, go ahead and do that. But um, um, if you drop off, thanks for thanks for coming in today. So, all right. So let's just go through a little bit about bundles and families and just um, the infrastructure here. Let's see if I can. Yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to give a little bit about how the families work and where that infrastructure resides. Um, and, and so what I'm talking about is the volume menu. Um, and this is severely hosed in the baseline. Um, a lot of the infrastructure just throws horrible errors and, um, and, and doesn't load. So I've re restructured my entire family area to try and build what we had in, in AWIPS 1 into it. Um, so you can see some of the volume browser um, or the volume menu families down in this area. I've broken out one comparison family that I'm starting to build here um, just to show you some examples here. And then on the right-hand side is one of the families. It's a reflectivity with precipitation type, um, and it's a nine-panel display uh, that you can make um, by getting into um, a little bit higher level um, with your editing. So these reside under the menus. Again, pretty straightforward in the volume menu. Uh, so you go into cave, menus, volume, and then I just sent you another slide here that goes into uh, what, what the main jump off menu is for uh, that volume menu in cave, um, D2D. And so the index.html is what I'm showing you right now. And that holds, as you can see, at the very top has some different variables that are actually set. And, and um, you see some of these substitute keys and a bunch of different model names there. What happens there is you can actually set, um, set a variable, and that's the key name, and then the value um, for that variable, um, and send the different volume families, those variables. I don't want to get into that too much today, but I just wanted to give you some feel for where some of the other menu items are located. You can see the calls to the menus. The first look that you see there is the four panel families. under the, It says submenu, four panel families. And the file name there that it calls is menus, volume, base, four panel families, um, which on the left-hand side you can see about six above the arrow. There is a base four panel families .xml file. So the, this file just calls the other family files. And so the three looks there, we have a base comparisons family, we have a convect model family. So that's where that infrastructure resides. Um, so in my comparison family, let's just look at the base four panel family just to give you a feel for what that looks like. John, can you tell me when you see that data file, XML file come up? I see right now one that says gem NH model at the very top yep. there. So there's contributes in there. Um, and, and the one I want you to be, you can see there's a menu text item that says gem NHM. For Northern, Hemis Gem, Northern Hemisphere Gem. So this is the four panel. So if you went to the four panel menu, this would be the first entry you'd see would be Gem, Northern Hemisphere. And then that calls another bundle, a bundles file, bundles volume default four panel dot XML. And so each of these entries is one of the menu items in the four panel compare or the four panel family. Um, and you can see it calls the same bundle and um, the substitute items underneath are the model names that are, so it basically sends a variable model name and calls the same bundle. So the bundle, you just send it a volume, uh, a menu, a model name, excuse me, a model name, and then it executes the same bundle volume four panel XML file. And so you have to track those down. Um, so you just keep following the path. So we saw the other one was bundles. Um, so let's go into comparison families here. So here's the file for comparison families. Um, and then the menu items. So if you went into comparison, you'd see these menu items. I'm waiting for the file to come up. It has um, 500 height. Okay. Yep. So you'd see the first under your comparison menu would be 500 height. Then you'd see MSLP. 
then the one below that would be surface dew point. And then they all call these XML files that you can look up. And in those XML files where some, some raw code um, to display these, these functions are, are in there. And that's probably um, a, second, a second training and probably can't get into that today. Um, but let's take a look at one of those. Let's just look at the run total. Let's look at the run total precipitation bundle, which calls bundles volume default run total precipitation. Okay, so I'm back to the D2D, to the cave, I'm sorry. We see cave bundles volume. See one now with the red, it says one pane. Good. So here's the bundles. We've tracked it down. We've gone to bundles, then the volume directory underneath that, just like that path said in, in the, the call in the last call file. And then we've looked at the arrow there is showing you that default total run total precipitation file, .xml file. And here are the contents in there on the right hand side of the screen. And so this is going to kind of look foreign to you, but this is now getting into a level of coding what uh, similar to what the procedures write to the procedure files. And it tells you everything, and your codes there, the, the tags for that are displays. That's one pane of display. So, so what you're seeing between the display and the forward slash display highlighted in red is one pane of information. And so that within there, you see all the different, in the middle section where I've highlighted the different keys or um, um, parameter settings, if you will. And um, so the MET field, the constraint value there says TP run. And so that's a total precipitation run. That's the, that's the key for that field. So if you went to the volume browser um, GUI file, that field um, file, and you looked up run accumulated precip, you'd see that TP run is the key for that to display that parameter. And then there's a bunch of other ones here. The data set, the GFS 212 you see on that line. That's the GFS. So now we've got run accumulated precip for the GFS. Different level types you can uh, you can put in there. Um, the level type there, or I'm sorry, different level one and level two, depending on what, if you want to look at a single level or a layer. And then the level type is just surface. So that's going to be the surface run total accumulation for the GFS. So that's the first pane in the upper left for um, my display to compare different things. Then if you go in the next display section, you can look at these parameters and the model may change. So you may have NAM, then you may have RUC, then you may have you know, whatever you want to put in there to, to give you your different displays. And so each one of those sections of display uh, displays will add a pane. Um, so I'm going to just whiz through this and make this my last section here. And then can you just, John, tell me when you see the file contents, the XML file? Yes, see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, it says group at the top and then D2D map renderable display. Okay. And so I'm going to do one scroll there and just show you what the next display entry looks like. And what you should see is um, a set of parameters in the center part of your screen and it, you'll see the ECMWF high res in there. So the next pane displays the ECMWF high res. Every other variable is the same. So you can just copy and paste this um, down below and change the model name and continue to work your way down and add panes to this display. Do you see that ECMWF in there, John? Yes. Yeah. Okay. T. Yeah. T. Prune. Prune. <laughs> run, right, right, right. TP run. Okay, so 
it's a little more convoluted to do some of these families, but I just wanted to give you some introduction on on where those were. And so I'm, I'm just sending you what the what my run total comparison looks like. Yep. So you, John, tell me when you have that precip image up. Yeah, nine panels. Yep. So you just keep building these, and so it's G, GFS, EC, blah blah blah, down and and you can make as many panels as you'd want to make. One final thing to mention, where are the source names for the models? Uh, in the D2D um, localization area under Volume Browser, there's a VB sources file. And within that, I'm not going to go into it here because we're out of time, but in that file, you'll see some of the model sources. Um, and that's, that's where you get your model names from to put into those. That's how I knew what, what the GFS 212 was. That's a GFS 40, basically. Um, so I think I'm going to call it quits there. Went a little longer than I had, than I had hoped for. But it's kind of tough to tell how long these will go. So any questions to end with here? Yeah, Dan, I got a question. How much work have you had to put into this, and, and uh, how much of your work is going to be in the, the baseline version of AWIPS 2 that you know, we're going to get here in a couple months? How much work have I put in? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that, Matt. Um, when I first came over with the system, I had to kind of see what the system order was like. I spent a good deal of last winter. I got it last November, and I spent a good deal of hours putting it in. So, um, you know, it, it a couple hundred probably over the year, um, and then um, you know, like. Um, Ken Cook came in and loaded my tar file up and basically took the year of work that I had done and on day two had invested that into a system and loaded it into a system. So there's a, there's a couple tar files that I've created for people to bring these in at the user level and see what they want to do if they want to migrate it to the site level. It's basically color maps, the fixes to the baseline and some of the fields to get them to display. Um, some of the science or levels we're missing, I've added those. I've reoriented the, the GUI so that it's usable. Uh, the baseline just was put all the put Baumgart supplemental fields in its own menu, which was really kind of corny. Um, and then the families are all rewritten uh, because those didn't load. So I've got a tar file that holds all that information, and it's pretty simple to load on your system. It's just deciding if you want to propagate it to site. And then working through some of these issues like Phil talked about, he's got some color tables and then my color set or style rules, and then I've got some style rules, and you know how do these all interact? But um, that's that's the short answer. And then Matt Foster told me um, this week that there is some work to get this incorporated into the baseline coming in the next six months. But I don't think it'll get into the baseline probably for at least a year, right, Matt? Um, year, year and a half. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have it not be quite that long. We just had a call yesterday uh, about prioritizing these things, and Greg and I made a case. And this is a call that's attended by all the regions and headquarters and the hydro and all those people. Uh, we made a case that uh, seemed to be pretty well received that, uh, A, th this is – pretty low-hanging fruit. It's, it's, it's configuration files. We're not talking about code changes here. Uh, it's just XML for the most part. And, and it's also something that's impacting nearly every forecaster in the Weather Service. So I think we made a case to get this checked into 15.1.1. And 15.1.1, I think, would be September 8th. Uh, Greg says September 8th. So uh, hopefully we can see this going out to the field in the baseline this fall. That is assuming that I can get it all checked into the baseline. Uh, we've got to have it checked into the baseline by March something. So 
uh, Dan, I'll, I'll be working with you over, you know, over the coming weeks to make sure we get everything finalized the way we want it, and then I'll uh, I'll check it into the baseline and hopefully we'll see it go out to the field in fifteen one one. Any other questions? Uh, Dan, this is, this, this is a comment, and um, what I would say is, especially on the last section that you had, had to go so quickly on in, in terms of bundles and families and, and those things, I have an exercise. It's, it's, it's a little dated, but, but in, if you, you, you go in, into the AWPS2 training page on the, the LMS, there, there is a, a, a long PDF of, of, of a bunch of, uh, of General Cave and Edex configuration exercises, and exercise nine is is all about uh, model families and bundles and things things like like that. So if you want want maybe a, a little different perspective with some different examples in it, um, it's it's that document is full of them. So yep, and I I forgot about that Dale. That I remember looking at that one first to get my bearings on what I had to work on. So that does give you the um, a walkthrough on the on handling bundles and creating your own bundles. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, Dale, could you uh, just, uh, before we wrap up, give us just a quick uh, rundown of where we're at with um, the uh, West Bridge, too, because I know there's some people on here. Um, well, um, we, you know, we, we are, are, are definitely a lot later than 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 what what we an anticipated, um, we are going through through testing and, and finding issues and and fi fixing them. We, we we also have have you know we've we've gotten a, a couple of of new d developers online uh, and we've we've been in the process of of get, getting them trained up. But but in the meantime, we've we've also lost one and 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 we are. Um, at, at, at least on on a full time basis, and and so so he, we we still have him available part time, and are are looking to 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 uh, to get a full time re replacement for him. But but at least he will 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 be able to help get the the the, the new person on, online. So so as 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 you know, we we are are working towards getting this. Is I mean, it's my my number one highest priority. Um, be, be because there's a lot of things we, we are, are doing that that hinge on the West to, to Bridge uh, working at, as well. Um, uh, the so 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 we we are are working on on final testing and 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 uh, there, there, and, and fi fixing a, a number of things as we we find them. Um, also, um, we um, are working through. Getting the last um, set of basic, basically uh, agreements set, set up to, to, to how West Two Bridge will will be connected to the um, to the to the uh, to the, the network in, in in each field office, and so we can't can't really go go forward with with a deployment until until that that request for change goes through, and 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 so we we are working on on that as well. Um, Finally, I would would say we we actually just today were were able to to get uh, licenses pr procured for the software that that will uh, allow burning to to Blu-ray discs, and so 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 we've we've got licenses for that procur procured for every West Two Bridge m machine, and so that 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 will help that too. So if, in, if anybody has has any particular questions about that. Feel free to, to uh, send me an email or, or give me a call, and, and I'll be, be happy to go into to more detail if, if that's what, what you would like. So, so what would you say a release date could potentially be? Well, I'm I'm hes hesitant to to say that be because it it depends on getting that request for for change through, and and I'm not. Not quite sure when when that's that's going going to happen. So, but but uh, you know, I, I I I I couldn't imagine will 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 be six months down down the line and not not have it. We 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 sim simply have to have to uh, 
get this this thing out so that we we are able to to uh, keep to re refine it and add cap cap capabilities. And we've we've got a lot of other courses that that de depend on it. So so. Um, but 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 I, I can't tell you because there are are just a, a number of uh, other things that that I don't know when they they will will come to their their completion. So I'm not 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 trying to 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 dog the question. I just just don't know know the the final ultimate answer. Okay, uh, thank you, Dale, and uh, Dan. Thank you so much uh, for today, and thank you everyone for your patience. <laughs> Uh, through all this. It was a nice long one, but uh, a lot of great information there. Um, Dan, thanks again. Yep, sure. Yeah, thanks, guys, for hanging in there. I know it was a little bit longer. It's a long time to watch somebody else talk, but hopefully it was helpful. And then at least we have this recorded for a, you know, as a reference, I guess. Very good. And Matt Foster, thank you, too, for your commentary. Will the recording be made available? Yes, yes. I'll, I'm actually going to be working on that this afternoon. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have yourselves a good day. Bye-bye.